Hi, I'm Michael Waits. This is episode four of Michael Talks Tech. Later in the show, we will be joined by Tiwa York. Tiwa is a veritable pioneer in the tech ecosystem space in Southeast Asia and in Thailand in particular. Tiwa was at the forefront of the development of the digital ad business and the digital marketing business, marketing business in Thailand. In particular, starting and working at a company called DMS and watching the development of that company um, over a period of more than 10 years. And I think really the theme here is going to be focusing on what that development and growth was like and how things have changed over time. Why is this so significant? Well, one of the reasons why we want to focus on personalities like Tiwa is because we want to expose the growth and the knowledge that they've experienced over the past really 10 years and let people in other ecosystems know that while it was quite immature 10 years ago, when pioneers like Tiwa were beginning to develop these businesses, we've kind of reached a tipping point. And we want to expose that tipping point to our viewers in the United States and to Europe so they can get a much better understanding of, while we're slightly more immature than the businesses outside of this region, they're way more mature than we think most people understand. And again, if you look at the types of businesses that are being developed now, not only are they copycat businesses, f focusing on things that people have learned and done in the West, but you're seeing leapfrog businesses, people that are developing completely new business models that are associated with what's going on in this region, and then developing those models with a local twist so that they grow better and faster here and are more finely attuned. Now remember, if you build an online business and you start that business in Boston, it's very likely that you'll get a similar reaction from the people in Boston, Chicago, Atlanta, <clears throat> and California. However, in Southeast Asia, it's slightly more complicated. And having people like Tiwa, who've built businesses not just in Thailand, but in the entire region, starting second generation businesses here gives a person like him a leg up, but also exposes the fact that these businesses are now ready for global and international recognition. <laughs> I'm here with Tiwa York. Tiwa is the head coach of Kaidi.com. Kaidi is a secondhand marketplace that's part of a global network. I'd like to first ask Tiwa to give us a little bit of background on what he was doing before he came to Thailand, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. Sure. I, uh, well, let's see. Hi, everyone. I started my career about uh, almost 20 years ago. Wow. So in, uh, in the United States, started in Portland, Oregon, working for a startup there, which is uh, in electronic medical records and um, ended up working as a product manager inside that organization. And then after the dot-com bust in 2000, decided I was going to go travel. So the original plan, Michael, was to do 16 countries in 10 months. 16 countries. Yeah, wow. and I, uh, I ended up doing two in, in the last 15 years. So <laughs> I uh, didn't go anywhere. I got stuck in Thailand and decided that this was a good place to stay. So what, made you, what got you stuck here? Uh, technically, my wife. I met my wife. And uh, wow. decided that right at the I, beginning. Yeah, I did. Good for you. I, I met her and I decided, you know what, I needed to try living here and hanging out and seeing if that relationship would go somewhere. And now, 14, 15 years later, we've got a daughter and working here ever since in the it, startup industry. It's definitely gone somewhere for sure. <laughs> yeah. So doing a little bit of research, right, I noticed that out of the top 25 websites that are in Thailand, eight of them are uniquely Thai. Right, including some of the most well-known gnomes in, in the Thai ecosystem. But the other thing that I noticed is that out of the eight that are uniquely Thai, you've been the senior most executive in two of them. Yeah. yeah. How, did, how did that happen? Well, I guess you probably have to go back in history. I'm, I would more, I'm a hired gun. So in terms of the organizations, the largest portal in Thailand is called Sanook. Sanook. Sanook.com, and that portal has been around since about 1999. Well, that's a long time ago. And so the shareholders asked me to come in and uh, take a look at that business and also clean up their um, e-commerce portfolio that they had with that business, alongside that business. And in that e-commerce portfolio, uh, one of the first things I did was we launched what is now Kaidi, 
and so kaidi.com. Uh, and so that was kind of one of the first projects, and that is now the only business that's now left in my portfolio. Uh, and uh, we launched that in September of 2011. Interesting. Is that an outgrowth of the Dealfish business? Yes. So originally, the first ver first name of the company was called Dealfish. Uh, subsequently, it was renamed as OLX. Understood. We are part of the OLX group, and then uh, we've subsequently renamed it to KaiD. And we can get into those details in just a second because okay. it is, probably is interesting to the listeners on how do you rebrand a business three different times, times. in four years? Right. But uh, let's back up a little bit more. Okay. So the DMS business. Yeah. Right. Was this your first real introduction to the Thai tech ecosystem? And if it was, like, how did you get involved with Impact Interactive? Sure. How did you meet those guys in that team? So at the time, when I got over to Thailand, I decided I want to try living here. I actually taught English part-time for about three years. Three years? Yeah, so quite a long time. And I was just chilling out and trying to decide what I wanted to do. And always with the thought that I would continue traveling, um, but I just continued to stay. So eventually I met the, um, the founders, John, Paul, which Tom. at that time. Yeah, and then uh, Tom. Our Tom came on, on later. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. came on later. Uh, I met those guys, and uh, they asked me to come in and help them build the business. At that time, Impact Interactive was just doing uh, rich media rich media ads. So in those days, we called them floating ads. They floated right. above the page. They were quite new uh, back in Was that when it was still days. associated with the MSN business yeah. and the Yahoo business? Yeah, yeah and at that time, we also um, we had closed a deal to start up msn.co.th. Wow, that's amazing. In Thailand. And so that was... Uh, part of the business. Um, I didn't have much to do with that part of the business. Okay. I was more on the agency side of it. On the agency side. And the agency ended up becoming what is uh, now known as New Media Edge. New Media, right. And so we started up the the media, the agency business out, out of that business. It was an outgrowth of that business. Okay. What was your background in media or in advertising or in the I, agency business? I didn't have any. Perfect. I was, uh, <laughs> I, my career prior to that had been in, you know, I was a uh, DBA, Oracle DBA, network engineer. Okay, but still tech related. And, yeah, tech related and had jumped over to product marketing. I had no idea. Okay. And then uh, taught English for three years and then ended up in this little startup doing uh, media and doing uh, advertising. I didn't know anything about it, but the good news was nobody else did either. I was going to say, in, in this Thailand. region, nobody would, would have known. No. So you could have been the most experienced person having no experience. Yeah, we back in those days when you're trying to sell you know, digital advertising, you know, if you got a $500 contract, you were really happy. <laughs> <laughs> you were like a rock star. Yeah, you're jumping for joy. Cause... But what was, what was the reaction like? I mean, in my conversations with Paul and with Tom and with John, they said they were early. Yeah. Really early. So they, they, they were all excited about it because they saw that business develop and grow in the United States. And they said, let's take what we know about Thailand being Thai. Yeah. Let's go build that business out there. Yes. But like, what were some of the roadblocks or some of the problems or challenges that you guys encountered? And how did you kind of get past them? I think um, topic number one was around education, educating the market. You know, uh, businesses didn't realize that they need to be online. Most of them thought, oh, well, maybe we need a website, but that's it. They didn't think about any type of online advertising, online branding, or any kind of performance marketing around that. Right. So a lot of our time was spent um, out just constantly pounding the pavement to educate the market. And, um, you know, a lot of the brand managers would look at you and you're like, they, they're like, I don't need this, right? I don't need this online stuff. I've already got TV, print, radio, and, you know, standard below the line stuff. Right. And so a lot of it was time spent just trying to educate them about the opportunities that you have with online and how much richer the experience can be. Was there like, was there an inflection point where suddenly, like after getting the first 10 or 20 or 30 pieces of business, you could then go and say, we've got Coca-Cola doing this. We've got these people doing this. You have to be, you have to participate. You know, it, it's funny because when you do startups, you always kind of forecast in these inflection points. Right, that's why you're modeling, right. right? And to be honest, uh, let's see, we we started. You know, John and Tom, John and Paul started that business back in 2003. Right. I think the industry finally hit an inflection point in around 2013, 2014. Right. I, mean, I, I feel like I was there for it actually. Yeah. It's yeah. just kind of started now, and so the advertising industry has now grown. Um, to around 250, 300 million dollar business in Thailand. Wow, it's just in Thailand. So it is, uh, you know, it still remains larger than the Indonesian digital advertising business. Right. Um, although Indonesia is going fast. It's growing so it's faster, growing but very, still. Very fast. yeah. But yeah, so Thailand is quite well developed in that area, but it took up until about 2013, 2014 to really start to take off. 
And 2015 was an inflection point where we grew from around um, around 100 and probably, I guess the estimates around 160, 175, 175 million business to 250. Which is massive. Yeah, it's a big jump this it's year. It's more than a third growth. Yeah. Yeah, it's and really And while big. all the other media is actually because Thailand's economy hasn't been as strong as it could have been right. this year, all the other media actually have had have struggled this year. Right, right, right. Print media in particular, yeah. right, is print, raising a lot of ads. Print has lost a ton. So right. print is a dying business globally. It is dying a very quick death in Thailand as well. Do you? So when you were involved in this business, right, I mean, from my understanding, the new media business and the DMS business in general was always meant to be in multiple countries, meant to be a regional business. Were you involved in any of the country entry or were you just focused on Thailand? In other words, so, what did you learn by the growth in those other countries? Yeah, so I played various different roles. Um, I <coughs> was mostly focused on Thailand. And then in about 2007, 2008, um, they asked me to start taking more of a regional role where I started looking at the different businesses and how we had market entry. Um, into, actually, it's less about market entry, more about fixing businesses. So, uh, Were those rolled up businesses or were those businesses that DMS started themselves and then tried to grow on their own? They were businesses that we, we started um, and in each then tried to grow. Right. So first step was into Vietnam in 2005. Can you um, talk about this? Because I've heard sort of stories about it, but I'd love to hear more detail. Yeah. Wow. That was, um, here, we had an assumption. We had had some really good growth in Thailand. And so um, Paul in particular had a aspirations to really move the business regionally. Right. So we decided, okay, well, let's try out, um, let's try growing into Vietnam. And we said, looks like uh, early market, similar to Thailand. It's not that far away. Right. So why don't we try the same strategy? We'll start to grow in our in our um, rich media ad business first, and then growing a an agency. Right. Now here's what we didn't know. What we didn't know was that the market was extremely small, and part of the issue was that you're looking at communist Vietnam. So actually, media is very very well controlled. All right. Whereas in Thailand, it's much more open, and you've I got a very healthy, developed media industry that had been developed over the last 50, 60 years. Right, right, right. In Vietnam, there was not an industry. It was very, very small. Is and it still really government controlled? And, it, well, it is because of the history of the government controlling right. the industry that there wasn't much media to be, to be developed. So we, um, we actually kind of got there and we were like, oh, wow, this is a lot earlier than we thought it was. Than we expected. And from there, we decided to move into the Philippines um, and Indonesia, eventually in Malaysia. So we were talking about the lack of growth or the lack of market space actually in Vietnam. And then you talked a little bit about um, the expansion into Indonesia and into the Philippines. And before we talk about those two countries, I just want to back up again for a second for me. Because you talked about how the business was started in 2003, yeah. and you think the inflection point took 10 years. Yeah, right? so the, slightly, yeah that, that's a long time, yeah. right? But so the question is, what changed? Right? I don't want to know what changed in 2013, but because you, you were involved in this business almost the entire time. Yeah, I think you left in 2011 or 2012. But either way, you saw a lot of this growth. Right? What was it that happened that made that market grow, that made people realize, wait a second, I need online? Was it that? e-commerce started? Was it that the e-commerce business came back and said, we need to help facilitate the e-commerce business? What, what, what do you think changed? Yeah, so between, if you look at between 2003 and 2013, what you're seeing is very organic growth. So what, it's not interesting. If you look at it from an investor point of view, you're looking for that, okay, that hockey stick type yeah, of growth exactly. in the market. And really it was very, um, very, very organic, very kind of uh, I shouldn't say step by step growth. You know, every year you see a certain amount of growth and a certain amount of percent growth, um, and so we never saw that inflection point. And I think what was causing that was partially about adoption, so adoption of, of technology in the market, um, and that's true for the region. And it wasn't until once we reached into the smartphone generation that we so started this, to see this, things. So take this off. is the big difference, I think. Right? Is that once three G moved into well, once three G moved into four G which I really think was a 2013 phenomenon, then things yeah. just exploded. Yeah, if you look in Thailand, I mean, I, we got our 3G license finally launched in 2012. Right. Right, uh, so wow. 2011 or 2012, it's somewhere it's, in one of those years. Yeah. And that's when things really started taking <clears throat> off. But it wasn't until the smartphone really took off that we really started to see mass adoption and real growth um, and uh, real penetration because 
if you look at it from a broadband perspective, where if you the Western world has been driven by broadband penetration, right. and that bo- broadband pen- penetration in our markets is not there um, for various reasons, but uh, that didn't really take off in the same way. So what you saw was most people were using their internet at work or at school, right. didn't necessarily drag it all the way to their house because it was expensive, didn't really need it. Didn't have one of these maybe even at yeah, all. Yeah, they'd have, most people had probably had a computer, but maybe didn't have the the same access to the internet. Right. So I think those factors really caused the significant growth that you've seen since 2011 through to today, 2015. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about this anecdotal evidence that you gave, I think, a couple of years ago where you said you went up country yeah. and you asked people if they use the internet? Yeah. And they said, yeah, so they said no. <laughs> yeah. I think this is, this is a new phenomenon in terms of the region. Right. And it's this whole concept that you actually jump from never having used a computer or right. internet to actually being online on your smartphone. Right. Um, and I think if you look at it from a Western point of view, you go, I don't understand that. That doesn't make, that doesn't compute. Any sense at all. Right. So I was out in the market, it's a pop-up market, um, and they've got everything for sale. I mean, it's absolutely huge. There's probably over a couple thousand vendors at the wow. market in a just east of Bangkok, a place called Chunbury. Okay, Chunbury. So I'm walking around and I see this uncle and he's in his 60s and he's selling, selling like antique stuff like the Coca-Cola signs. Right. So I asked him, uncle, I said, do you have a smartphone? He goes, yes, I do. I said, uncle, do you use the internet? And he goes, no, I don't. I said, uncle, do you use Line, the chat application? Yeah. He goes, yes, I do. Uncle, do you use Facebook? Yes, I do. Uncle, do you use Google? Yes, I do. Uncle, do you use the internet? No, no I, I don't. don't. <laughs> and you know, this is one of my favorite stories. It's, it's well, it's it's really telling about how much stuff has moved. And right. you know, in the late '90s, when we were all in this business and we we're all excited and we we're like, "Oh, we're going to change the world. We're doing these startups." We had this word called ubiquitous, and that was like the buzzword. Everybody's like, "Oh, the internet's going to be ubiquitous." <laughs> And it's taken up until now for that to actually become true. It actually has. And now it's finally become ubiquitous. And we're just starting. I mean, this is about the black slab that we call a smartphone. Right. Now we're moving the Internet of Things, and things are really moving in this area. Right. So when I tell this story to people, whether I tell that story to people internationally or even locally, they say what you said. I don't understand. Like, I can't understand the concept yeah. of somebody not knowing they'd be using the Internet. So what I, tr- what I try to consolidate this into a different thought, and I say... If you went to somebody in 1930 and said, are you using these waves? Yeah. They'd say, no. You'd say, well, do you listen to radio shows? They'd say, yes. Yeah. But you're not using those wavy things, yeah? yeah? No, I just turn that thing on and I get the music. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing. It's an important shift. And to give you another, another example of this, another anecdotal story, is um, my head of UX and I were standing at my whiteboard back in 2012 and we started doing use cases. Right. And we brought up my mother-in-law. Your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, she's got a 10th grade education from Chiang Mai. And she has a, she had a smartphone. smartphone. And the person that hooked her up was our, was our, our, our um, housekeeper. So our housekeeper connected her to our Wi-Fi and hooked her up with Facebook and Line right. and Instagram. Right. And we started doing this use case. What kind of we, phone was she using? She was using a Samsung. So an Android. Uh, uh, yeah, an Android. Low-end Android. Um, but it was Samsung, I think. But it was a low-end Android okay. device. And we started doing the use case, and we realized on KID, we required email. Right. Here's the problem. My mother-in-law has no idea what email is, no, never no. opened it in her life, no. has no idea what you would use it for. Right. And that's when we realized, oh my gosh, we have a, we have a real use case problem on right. our own platform. Because you could have 40 million people that don't understand email. Correct. Yeah. And so we actually had to back out email as a required field in terms of your registration process. And now we only... It can be email, it can be your phone number, it can be just Facebook. We don't care. And so it's the realization that user behaviors have completely changed. So when you did that, did you see growth in user base? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it becomes easier for people to... So it's directly related to their ease of sign up. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's really... I haven't heard that before, actually. But it's really interesting. I don't think about it a lot. I mean, I set my mom and dad up on email when Hotmail was popular. Yeah, so about 20 years ago. 1934, I think it was. I can never remember exactly what it was. And let's back up again and talk about this expansion into the Philippines and Indonesia and maybe some of the challenges that were there Mm -hmm. and how that growth was different than the growth in Thailand but also in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah, and I heard also from from the guys that Vietnam was a very domestic market as well. So even if you were doing really well, 
you ran into kind of domestic issues. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. So there are things that you would expect that you would see popular in other countries um, that just aren't popular in Vietnam. Got it. So where you see massive use of, of YouTube or, or Facebook and things like this. And Facebook wasn't allowed in the country until 2012, 11 or 12. They've right. been blocked. Right. So now you're seeing the growth of Facebook, but prior to that, it wasn't there. So you do have these idiosyncrasies by country. Right. You know, if you go back 10 years ago, each country had a different email platform that they was popular. So Thailand was a hotmail market. Right. Uh, Vietnam was a Yahoo market. Yeah. Uh, so Philippines was a Yahoo market. And then Malaysia was a mixed market. So each of these markets had different, different use cases, different types of behaviors that you'd see from the consumer groups that were online. Um, and so I think you actually do have to take it as a um, kind of a different approach for each market. Yeah. And the, the, what's interesting is uh, The Economist did an article, and if you look it up, you can find me interviewed. And I asked them, what's the article about? And they said, well, we're doing an article on the digital economy of Southeast Asia. I said, you guys do realize that six different countries, six different languages, six different cultures, different religions. Right. It's not one thing. It's right. very different. There are very distinct different countries here. Right. I mean, I like to say if you start a company in Boston, you can move it to California without even thinking about it. Yeah. It's English. It's the whole, all the cultures the same, essentially. Yes. Right. But here, it's really different. It's completely different. Completely different, which yeah. is interesting. And the things that you have to understand about Thailand versus Vietnam or versus Philippines or Indonesia are very different. You know, in yeah. Indonesia, you're dealing with a uh, Muslim country. Largest Muslim country There's, in the world. Yeah, and yeah. you're dealing with very different topics than you are in Thailand. For you know? sure. In Thailand, if you're a media business, you have to be very aware of the royal family mm -hmm. um, and uh, the sensitivities around things around the royal family. Yep. In Indonesia, those things are around being being Islam. Yep. You know, you've got to be sensitive about those topics. Same with Malaysia. Right. But in Malaysia, you've got a different set of topics as well because not only in Malaysia do you have Malaysians, you also have a huge Chinese, Chinese population. population and another Indian population. And those right. three populations, those three groups, ethnic groups, don't really intermingle that much. It's really, it's really interesting, and I, yeah. I hadn't thought about talking about this today, but in Thailand, you also have a very large Chinese population and a very large like embedded Indian population as well. It seems to me, at least externally, to be very little tension. Correct. Right. So some of your wealthiest families are Chinese, some of your biggest operators are Indians, and then you know some of your wealthiest families are also Thai. Yes. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of contention there and yet in Mo the Malaysian experience has been completely different yeah. which also changes the way you do business there as well correct because it's very segregated yes and there is contention yeah and so that makes a difference I mean in Thailand because of the the, the history of the country it's been um, very easy to adopt other cultures in and very accepting and very open to it so the Chinese they came in they they when they moved here they intermarried with Thais, they also took on Thai last names. names, they also adopted Buddhism as right. a religion and right. things like that. Really important. Yeah. Okay, so we spent a decent amount of time talking about the DMS experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about the transition from DMS into kind of your next incarnation and just how it all happened and why you left DMS in the first place? Yeah, so I think um, it'd be interesting to hear uh, some of these stories around DMS from Paul or Tom or John. but. Yeah. If you look at it, you know, we struggled as a business. We, in some cases, we grew too fast. Right. Uh, we had to do a couple different um, kind of uh, uh, layoffs in 2008, 2009. That's hard work. It was very hard really work. Really hard work. And, you know, it, it's... Uh, I think sometimes people hear these stories, whether it's DMS related or anything related, and think, oh, these companies just cut people like it doesn't mean anything. But frankly, it's been my experience that when that thing happens, it's hard yeah. on both sides. No, and I think part of it was uh, we, we kind of, we had these aspirations for growth. We were young and we were um, excited and in, excited and inexperienced. And so we were growing, growing, growing. And then we got to a place where, oh no, the market hadn't taken off. So right. the market hadn't followed suit. Right. And we probably had, had not really managed ourselves well enough. Fair and enough. so we actually had to come down and just tell the team we need to lay them off. I mean, we were going out for bridge loans. And fundamentally, it wasn't because the teams were bad. It was because... We couldn't pay them, right? And those are really hard yards. Yes. Um, so we did that, and then I was asked to drop back into the business from a regional, regional role, in uh, 2009, and that was to kind of clean up uh, and, and kind of fix Thailand and turn around the business. So I did that, and so we did that, and by the time we were looking at halfway around, uh, 
halfway through 2010, I was looking at going, okay, kind of done my job here, guys, right. and know where we're at. It was kind of time for me to move on. Right. So I told the, um, the CEO that it was, it was now time for me to move, move jobs. So now when I look back, I think it was kind of crazy because I actually moved without any plan in place. Um, I had no plan. I just said, I know that this is not right, so it's time for me to move on. Although I wasn't worried. I knew I could find work. Right. So it wasn't that wasn't a challenge. So I ended up um, getting pinged by Omnicom Media Group, and they asked me to set up their digital division of uh, Omnicom here in Thailand. In Thailand. So I said, they asked me to come on board full time. I said, no, I'm not ready to call it full time. So I did that part time. Had you ever worked at a corporate job before that? Really? No, this was my first one. Okay. So, I mean, besides the startup that we had. I understand, but that's not working. Like, Omnicom's a big company. Yeah, nothing. With a massive infrastructure and a whole bunch of politics internally that don't exist at startups necessarily. Correct. I had never dealt with anything like what that. What was that like? Um, that was a change of pace for me. Uh, it was definitely <laughs> a change of pace where I think I ruffled a few feathers because Thank the you. attitude was, come on, guys, let's get things done. Let's move. we got to right. move fast. And um, for the traditional business that they had, they that wasn't no. standard practice for them. Um, I think they've changed now, for sure. but uh, back in those days, it definitely was a bit of a yeah, bit of a um, making waves a bit inside the organization. So I did that for seven months and um, set up a team, hired some people, and then decided that yeah, this isn't for me either. Right. So I left again without a plan. Now this time was actually quite serendipitous because I left without a plan and in the following six weeks I received 15 different phone calls with offers. Um, nobody what, knew I was on the market. But nobody why, did. But why do you think that happened? Because again, think, this is another tipping point, right? Where something must have changed. Yeah, I think everybody was looking for staff and everybody was looking for experienced uh, people that running businesses and running digital businesses. Right. And by the way, that's still true today. It is. Um, Can you characterize the type of companies? Were they startup companies? Were they like... It's everybody from everybody. Sony to, okay. uh, to where I'm at now. Um, you know, it, there's big companies that were looking for just seasoned digital executives that were, you know, had some, some sort of experience running a digital business. Well, you had 10 years of experience at that point. Yeah, so pretty close. And, um, you know, even today, people are still looking. I mean, if I may... I may get hurt for this, but Facebook is looking for a country manager. Know, Google's I, looking I know, for a country manager. So it's... it's And it's not like those are poorly paid jobs. No, they're very well paid very jobs. Very well paid jobs, and right? It's, it's just finding the right people for with sure. the right experience. So I moved, and at the same time, um, what is now uh, Kaidi uh, called me, and they asked me to come on board and take care of the e-commerce portfolio. And So this is the Sanuk business this that you mentioned Sanuk earlier. business, correct. And at the time, they didn't have a CEO, so they asked me to be interim there as well. So that's how I got into this business. And one of the first projects, again, as I mentioned earlier, was launching what is today KaiD, which at that time was named Dealfish. But you also said you shut down a couple of businesses. You cleaned up their portfolio. What yes. was the strategy so, there, if you can talk about that a little bit? When I first came in, I didn't have one, to be honest. <laughs> didn't have one. <laughs> um, you know, I looked at the uh, looked at what was around me, and, and we tried running it, running the business and trying to change the business. So at the time, we had a um, B2C marketplace, and the B2C marketplace was called shopping.co.th. Right. Uh, it, and it's good, first... That's a, that's a good um, URL. I it's agree. a good URL. It was launched as a partnership with eBay, and um, but the business hadn't really grown and it was struggling along. It was it was a healthy business, probably number one or number two, two marketplace time, yeah. in Thailand. If you looked at real transactions on platform, it's right. probably number one. Was this the Sabai? And it turned into Sabai. We rebranded, <coughs> tried to start to push it towards a first first party seller marketplace right. um, where we'd start taking on our own goods and start inventories and things like that. Got it. So we had that business. We also had another business, which was the number two daily deal site. Uh, the coupon. It's a new coupon, yeah, uh, competing with Insogo. Um, that we must were, have been interesting. We were definitely well behind in terms right. of our competition. I mean, by that time, Insogo had owned huge. 80 or 85% of the market already. Right. So I had these two things in my portfolio, along with this little site called Dealfish, our little you know, secondhand goods marketplace. Right. And the thing was, was that if you looked at between 2011 from just starting through to 2013, Dealfish had just grown. 
is just growing. Yeah, really I mean, it was always fast. my impression that Dealfish was like one of the fastest growing sites in yeah. Thailand. And month by month, we saw consistent just growth, and it was beating. You know, every target I would set, it would beat it. And then I remember you shaved your head once or something. Yeah. So yeah, we did. That was in 2013 right. on a bet. Right. And it was just growing. And in the meantime, I had these two other businesses that were not, and they were you know very capital. Intensive and probably um, time intensive, time intensive, intensive yeah. and um, people intensive. Right. So we looked at the portfolio. We said, okay, what are we going to do? Do we really want ourselves spread this thin? And so we did a we did a strategy session around this. And uh, after a day and a half of looking at it, everybody looked across the table at me, our investors, uh, our shareholders, our our team, my CFO, my CTO. Right. Everybody looked at me and said, "Tiro, what are we going to do?" And I said. It seems that we're going to close the businesses. Right. So that's what we did and focus. And the idea was that with the, the Kaidi business, Dealfish at that time, we knew what we were doing. We knew exactly why we were doing this. And I think this is an important point to make, which is with Kaidi, look, we, it's our why. Why do we wake up in the morning? It's because we believe buying and selling secondhand items actually helps your life. In our little way, reduce, reuse, recycle. Yep. And we knew why we were doing this business. Whereas in the other two businesses, kind of weren't. It didn't have the same clarity right. of what we were doing. Actually, I had a ton of competitors, so the question was, why would you come to me? Right. Right. Well, Whereas, this is my big question, if you don't mind yeah. interrupting, about the e-commerce business, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it's so easy to start a pure e-commerce business where you accumulate product. How do you differentiate? Yeah. Right? Particularly in a place that's greenfields, I could start an e-commerce business not using Page 365 and Facebook in yes. 10 minutes. Yeah. So what was the what was the edge? It's a great it's great though that you guys actually, if you don't mind me saying, had the balls to just go, no. Yeah, that's right. what we did. We you have to, no. though. Yeah. And the thing was, was that how do we really differentiate? And what is the thing that we're doing and our why? Knowing why we're doing this. Exactly. Whereas in the, you know, what I inherited were they were good opportunities. They weren't really, why are we doing this? But with this particular one, right. Kaidi, we knew that's why we're doing it. Right. And it continues to this day build our North Star of why we're doing these things. So do you think, and this is actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, but do you think that, so eBay started in a way like Kaidi did. Yeah. People have things, they want to sell those things, and it helps their lives. Yeah. You know, I have all these old albums, I have these Pez things or whatever they were yeah. at the beginning, and I just want to move them. Yeah. But then what happened was eBay turned, because it was first this auction site, which is weird when you think about it. Yeah. People would watch the auctions and stuff. But now it's turned into a much more professional marketplace. Right? In a way, and similar to what's happened to Facebook here. Yeah. So eBay now dominates in that space, where it's real professionals who have real inventory sell stuff on eBay. Yeah. Is that the same thing that's going to happen to... Um, to Kaidi? Yeah, to Kaidi. No, I think... Uh, no, we don't believe in that. We okay. believe that we have a very specific thing that we're doing, um, and that is really unlocking people's valuables that they have, the, the valued goods that they don't use anymore. Right. And so whereas eBay... Um, you know, they kind of existed in this space and they did a fabulous job, right? right. And they still own the auction space. Yep. But in the meantime, in the States, you also had Craigslist. Right. And Craigslist yeah. is still an awesome business. It is. And no matter how many people criticize their, their UI and, and, and all these other things. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They doesn't have a great matter. business. You know that if you want to sell your secondhand car, you want to sell yep. your secondhand goods, yep. you put them there. Right. Because you know they're going to sell. Yeah. And I think that's really important for the business. And for Kaidi, we really believe that what we're trying to do is unlock that value for for the consumers that don't use don't have their stuff. So how do you use the relationship with your because you said it's part of a global network? Yes. So how do you use your relationship with the global networks yeah. to drive the business that's taking place here? Do you get best practices from them? Do you get development from them? Like where yeah. where does it all start? All right. So you know before we go into how the Global network helps us. Maybe I need to back up a little bit in history so that the, the the audience understands what we're talking about. So, like I said, I was a hired gun, and really, I'd call myself an entrepreneur, as opposed to the entrepreneur that everybody's talking about for the startup. So, at, in that role, over the years, we've had several different changes at the shareholder level. So, when I started oh, the business, okay. we had a certain set of shareholders. Right. Um, subsequent to that, the two shareholders decided um, it was probably better for them to go separate different ways. Interesting. Um, and those shareholders included uh, the likes of Nasper, the South okay. African company, yep. Tencent, the Chinese company. Mm -hmm. And today, with the latest JV that happened, we're actually now part of a global network of businesses, and I'm related to pretty much everybody. 
Um, and so uh, there's a, there is a press release, so you can look it up online to get the official look at it. Since I can't officially make statements, since they are public companies, but you know our shareholder group um, includes people not just Naspers but also uh, Shipstead, Telenor, and. Singapore Press Holdings. Interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. So with this, ex with all these changes along the way, different strategies and different um, asks of our business have been made. So we started out with the name Dealfish. The first step to that was to try to create a global brand under OLX. So then we rebranded to OLX on March 3rd, 2014. I remember that. Subsequently, in, in November, this J Global JV was announced. And as part of that Global JV, Thailand was in the mix of all those things that happened, um, they decided they wanted our team, our platform, and the brand was up to us, which brand that we wanted, because this was actually a merging of what was an existing site, very new site called KaiV and, and OLX Thailand. And they left it up to the team. And so we looked at the business and we said, first of all, we're Thai, we're doing this for Thailand. And it seems to me that KaiV is a better brand for the Thai market. Right. Um, there's a couple other idiosyncrasies for the listeners that aren't familiar with Thai. Uh, for example, X does not exist in right. Thai language. The so sound. to to spell yeah. O L X in Thai script actually took seven characters. Right. So there was a couple technical things like that. So we decided that we would rebrand to Kaidi, and which is happens. really easy to write in Thai. Yeah, and we we yeah it means sell well. So there is a meaning behind it. Right. We rebranded on March 12, 2015. Oh, so right. we Kai is a year D. in between. Yeah. Um, today, we figure that if everything, if things go really poorly for me and my team, that we're going to go start a branding agency. We've done this twice. <laughs> We've, We've done this so many times. We've done this so many times. And actually, the first time when we rebranded Dealfish, part of that we were Sinop Classifieds. I didn't know that. Okay. So we actually rebranded and Three launched. Times. Yeah. So it's been uh, quite exciting to. And basically, people ask me, what do you think of rebranding? I say, look, trust me, if you can avoid it, never do it. Right. But if you have to do it, actually, it turns out to not be the Such worst thing deal. in the world. Yeah, it doesn't. Right. As long as you're adding value to your customer, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So what does the global network then give you as a benefit to running that business here? So I think it shortcuts a lot of things. So we're able to get best practices and a lot of sharing um, from our sister companies around the world, whether that's... Um, you know, such companies out of Sweden or Spain or Brazil wow. or even Vietnam or Indonesia, um, being able to tap in that network and do things and, and learn about things. Um, you know, we'll launch something and a lot of times you'll launch something, you don't know if it's performing well or not. You don't know if that feature or that, that function is good or bad. So being able to reach around the world and say, okay, what was your experience with right. this? And being able to learn and leverage off of that is, is extremely valuable. What's your communication channel like with these other, I guess, head coaches? And that's another question for me yeah. is, you seem to have moved away from calling yourself like a CEO or any sort of classic executive name. What's the reason? Okay, so And then you can talk about what your relationship is with the other people. Um, so mine's a bit unique. Uh, I, I call myself head coach. This happened um, about two years ago. I started to have a real... Uh, what should I say? Revolution and how I look at managing and how I look at uh, running teams okay. after having done it for so long. And um, basically, you know, being CEO or MD is about my ego. And egos don't win games. Yeah, for sure. Egos don't win the season. Egos don't create success. Right. And so, really, if you look at my job, my job is to coach my team. And, you know, ultimately, I'm on the sidelines during the game and my team should be on the field playing. And they need the autonomy to make decisions. And my job is to make sure I've got the right players on the field. Got it. And setting the great gameplay and the right strategies behind that. Right. And I think the the change in my naming was as head coach was really looking reflecting of what my job really should be. Right. And also to challenge my ego. And and let me be honest with the audience here, which is <laughs> I like being called CEO, by the way. I do enjoy it. Right. And, you know, it is funny when the Thai media, they go, really, do you want me to call you head coach? Because when you translate it, it says team lead. Right. And they're like, aren't you like the, the top dude of, in the yeah. business? Right. And I'm like, yeah, but no, write it like that. Because right. calling me the top dude in the business is about me. It's not about my, my, my team. Completely understood. Yeah. What, what was the reaction from staff? Like, did you see a difference in the way people treated you internally? I think the Were staff... Were they more open to like... Um, you know, I think... I wouldn't say that there was a clear step because I think this has been 
evolving over time. Right. And the team, I think they, they do like calling me head coach. And I think it does bring down some barriers where it's not so formal as like, oh, wow, this guy's the, the CEO. CEO. Right. That yeah, sounds so, really important and fancy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Can we switch gears a little bit? Sure. Mobile. Yeah. Can you talk about mobile penetration in Thailand in particular and Southeast Asia in general and how you think that that's going to impact or has impacted your business? Okay. Um, sure. So if you look at, let's just put out some stats out there. So there's a, depending on which source you look at, there's a 94, 96 million mobile subscribers in Thailand for a population of 68 million people. So about 150% mobile penetration. Yeah. So it's a massive mobile penetration. Out of that, you look at S, uh, 3G or mobile internet subscribers, people that actually use their data plans. You're right. looking at 45 million at the moment. So out of 68 million, however, those are not unique. So when you actually dedupe the number of mobile users in Thailand and you actually get down to real unique users, our estimation today is at about 35 million. Okay, so million half, half, the, half the population is Correct. We're about mobile 50, internet users. Yeah, we're about 51, 52% penet penetration at the moment. And how does that compare to Western countries? Uh, so Thailand. other, no, so well, if you look at Western countries, like if you look at Western Europe, you're looking at 60 to 80% penetration. Okay. Okay. So Thailand's starting to get to that inflection point finally. Right. Um, and all of this has really grown in the last, say, two to three years. That's what it, it feels really like. really taken off. Yeah. Um, and so, and mobile is the leading part of this, right? It's just, it just changed the world. And so where we used to talk about back in the day in the industry, we talk about third screen, we talk about that mobile is the third screen and things like that. And the reality is it's your first screen. It is. And it's everybody's first screen. Right. It's the first thing you touch in the morning, the last thing you touch at night. Right. It's your so, alarm clock. Yeah. It's, for God's sake. it's everything. Yeah. And so it is no longer, you know, TV is your third screen now. Right. Whereas just a few years back, it was the first screen, right. quote unquote. I think that change, that shift has been massive to the industry. And so when we launched uh, Kaidi in 2011, you know, we launched as a website. Right. And then quickly in 2012, we realized, oh man, this, this thing's changing fast. So we went to a fully responsive They're website sponsored. and we were mobile, mobile centric, mobile first. Right. And what's interesting is a lot of companies today will still say, oh, this year we've got to be mobile first. Actually for Kaidi, we're saying, forget mobile first, we're app first. Right, that's what I was going to say, because that's the real progression, right? Yeah. That's how you keep people so, locked in. Exactly. So for us, and and people say, too, what does that mean? What's the, how does that, differ and it actually matters and here's why it matters Tell it, me. it matters on how your team thinks how about the business about okay so what happens is back in the day i build a website we're all sitting on desktops we built a website and right. then we build an m site or, right. or, or a responsive site so then next we think about how it looks on the mobile phone and after we think about that then we think about our apps right so by really being mobile first, they're saying, oh, I'm going to put the M, M site first. Right. What, reality, was your, what was your opinion of these mobily responsive websites anyway? Yeah, I think they're, they're very valuable and they're still valuable for us. Okay. I mean, they still make up a massive percentage of our traffic. Do they? Um, you know, if you look at it, desktop's 38% of Kaidi's traffic. Uh, mobile represents, uh, sorry, it's less than that. Mobile's 70% of our, of our traffic, so only about 30% is actually desktop. Right. Um, but out of that 70%, the majority is mobile web. Really? So it's not app-based? No, it's still not app. We're still trying to mo migrate people over to app-based. Interesting. Um, it is growing and it is a healthy part. Right. So it is significant, but it's not the majority. And I think this is where the shift in mindset really matters, which is now what I've told the team is you develop for Android first. Right then iOS, yep. and then the browser. What's the install base like in Thailand, Android versus iOS? It must be massively skewed, no? So it is massively towards Android, but if you look at dip internet usage, it's actually very much, uh, it's now Android is just taking off. So okay. it's you're looking at, supposedly it's about 70 or 80% Android, if I understand the stats correctly. But um, if you look at actual usage, the split is not as skewed towards that. So, uh, as I was saying about the, the split, um, if you look at devices, what they say about devices in Thailand, smartphone, smartphones are about 50% of the market today, obviously the majority of sales, 80% of that being Android. Now, if you look at it, that's true, but if you look at the actual traffic split, iOS users in Thailand are much heavier users than Android. And so for a long time, right up until middle of 2014, July 2014, we actually saw that Android had caught up to iOS in terms of usage on our platform, 
and they were basically head to head. But then suddenly in July 2014, Android started taking off. And so today, what you're looking at is uh, Android is about 65 to 70 percent of our traffic compared to iOS. Um, although iOS users are still very heavily engaged, it's just that the Android users have matured in terms of their adoption right. of the platform. So, you know, all this ties back to the app first mentality, which again, as I mentioned earlier, what, what does that mean? When I first mentioned this to my team, they said, Tiwa, why does that matter? And it matters is because if you look at it, today, we do about 175, 180,000 daily active from apps only. From apps only. Okay. From apps only. Total on the platform is about 600,000. A day. A day. Um, daily active users. So out of 600,000, 400,000 being on browsers, on, less than 200,000. On computers. Uh, the browsers. browsers. So mobile browsers. Mobile browsers. Or okay. Apps. Or in 175,000. <clears> would you rather have 400,000 on apps and 200,000 on browsers? And the answer is, of course. Right. And the reason is because on a browser, you have to remember the URL. You have to remember how to get to the person. They can always change. It's right. all these other things. I can't notify them. So there's a lot more valuable real estate on being an apps for first sure. business. For sure. um, I, I got asked an interesting question the other day, which somebody said, Tiwa, what would you dif do different if you had to launch your business in 2015? And definitely I would have gone with the app first right. and then pulled myself back over to the browser experience. Right. I mean, look at the Instagram business. Exactly. Right. Exactly. They, for such a long time, they were like, where's your web business? Doesn't matter. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody cared. And that's, you know, that's a change in the business. And it really is a mentality shift for the companies that are, that started out as web centric. So how do you drive downloads? In other words, how do you get to that point where there are 400,000 people using the app and only 200,000 people using the browser? Yeah. So I guess this kind of comes down to our, our, our marketing initiatives around this. This year, we actually started uh, in the middle of the middle of the year, we started pushing um, how to transition our own users over to apps. Right. And I'll tell you the fundamental problem that every business has around this, which okay. is you're doing your marketing, you send them it straight into your into the browser, and you send them straight into your website. Now, the problem with the apps is that now you have to take them out of that environment right. and over to the app store, right. and you don't know if they're ever going to come back. Right. And this is why it's so hard to transition, because you're scared. But why does that have to happen? So I've always wondered, when you click on that thing that says, you know, the Google Play Store or the iOS Store, it clicks you on it, and then it brings you to the App Store. Yeah. Why doesn't it just, you're asking, download the app? Yeah. How come you can't do that? That one you have to ask Google and Apple. Okay, but that's know. not something you do. No. Not meaning you, but the general you does. That's yeah. their policy? Yes. Yeah, you got to click on that thing and go there and then click again. It's the Play Store and the App Store's policies that force you there. And the problem is once I take you there, will you ever come back? This is the biggest problem, right? And it's scary. It's yeah, yeah. scary for the marketers. Because <clears throat> well, you could go to the App Store and next to the Kaid yeah. app, there could be a game. Right. And you're like, ooh, yes. I'm downloading that thing. Yeah. And exactly. then you forget. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, my Wi-Fi isn't so good, or it just takes me too long to download the app. Never I mind. never come back. Yeah, never mind. Right? Yeah. I all of a sudden have jumped on. So that was our first initiative this year. And so far, it's paid off well. Good. But, um, you know, ours isn't just a online marketing business. We actually do a lot of TV, mar TV ads and things like that How as well. How does that work? Um, it works very well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so how, though? In other words, what's the, what's the conversion? How does that work where... I'm sitting there watching a drama or a TV show, and I see an ad for Kaidi. Yes. And does it have the Google Play and the App Store logo there as well? Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll put it there, but it's less about that than it is about the branding. But the branding will trigger people to go and find it. And what's, what's fascinating about this is uh, the first time we launched a TV campaign was in 2012. Okay. And um, it was the first time in my whole career of pitching you know, multi-device usage could I prove it. And what you see is that the use case, the behaviors have changed so much that when somebody sees that on TV, what they do is they pick up their phone and, and just they do it right actually away. They do it right away, and they go to your service, and so it actually becomes an effective integration between medias right. that people are constantly interacting. Uh, Michael, think about your own behavior. How many times have you sat there and you saw a movie and you're like, "Ah, oh, who's that actress?" And All the immediately time. Immediately open up IMDb, All the time. right? I watch that the NFL on Monday morning. You yeah. know, I watch the Sunday games, yeah. and I have my phone with me. I wonder how long this guy's been in the NFL. I do this all the time. Yeah. All and the time. that's just common practice now. Yeah, yeah. And so I think as marketers, uh, digital marketers, you actually have to think a little bit broader about how people are really interacting with media. It's not only about being on Google or Facebook. It's actually there's 
a lot more comprehensive ways to approach this, inclusive of offline. So how do you quote, offline how, how do you track? Right. So if you run an online ad, you can tell if somebody clicks on it. You can have metrics, thousands yeah. of different metrics around that. But how do you know if somebody sees it on TV and yeah. then acts immediately? Can you measure that? Yes, we know exactly. Um, and because you can see the spike, you can see the. So you increase. know when the ad's running. Yes. And then you can watch the traction. Correct. I mean the traffic. Correct. Hmm. And we can see it immediately. We can see the impacts of, of that particular ad spot. And the reason is that people say, isn't it expensive? And the truth is... Because that was going to be my next it is, question. It is expensive. Um, but is it more expensive the, from a customer acquisition standpoint than just doing regular ads? Or? ROI is, is, very, very, is very, very strong with it. Right. But the other important thing is education. Right. And remember who I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to reach yeah. the average Thai to sell their unused goods. Right. And a lot of these, a lot of... A lot of my target audience, they're new to the internet. They're, they don't know that they're using We the talked internet. about this earlier, right? They right. don't even know they're on the internet. Exactly. So, so now it's about com trying to express our core value proposition to them for them to go, oh, wow, this sounds useful. Right. Right. And being able to give the brand awareness for our business. What's the, and you might not know the answer to this question, but I'm really curious. What's the, like, the conversion rate for people who watch, let's say, watch it on TV or see an online ad, they sign up. Are these people automatic sellers? So they sign up because, oh gosh, I want to sell my stuff? Or are they looking for cheap goods? So is it more people coming in to buy or more people who come in for the first time to sell? Or is it just split 50-50? It's an interesting question. So we've actually done a lot of work on this. Um, I won't share the exact Yeah, I don't want to know exactly, uh, but I'm just but curious. There's definitely, um, we do end up activating sellers. A lot of our marketing has been focused on activation of sellers, but okay, it's not immediate. Right. And the reason is because if you're a seller, you're going to come check out stuff first. You're right, going right. to see what's for sale. You're going to think about, oh, my product, how much are other people selling it for? So right. it, there is a lag time between activation of, say, an offline media to when that person becomes an active seller. So Got there it. is a lag time there. But in terms of between the offline media and activation of that person coming in to browse your site, that's immediate. And so it may take us time before we can convert them over to becoming a seller. Into an active seller. Yeah. But they just sign up right exactly. away. Exactly. And, you know, when we look at our active sellers um, and people say, Tiwi, you you have quite a big platform. Right. Well, yeah, okay, so it's all relative. Um, look, there are 1.2 million people that sold on our on our platform yep. in 2014. Uh, this year will be over two. We'll probably be two, two and a half million. So you'll double in size. We'll double in size. But that's still out of... Two and a half million is a very small percentage of 68 million. And our view of this is that, you know, what do we want? Where's our big picture goal is that we want 68 million people to have the experience of selling one item right. that they don't use anymore. Right, because everybody has something. It, they all and we're not going to have a ton of stuff and exactly. selling it rid of. Exactly. Right. And it, it but does is it, sell. is it easy to do? I mean, I used to look at trying to sell stuff on eBay or when I lived in Japan on, on Yahoo. Yeah. It just seems so hard to do. Um, we okay. require four fields, four four pieces and a, of information. And a photo. A photo, well, a photo is one of them. Right. Photo, uh, the price, a title, right, and a telephone number. That's it. That's it. That's all we require, and that telephone number that you put in actually becomes your login. So okay, so it's really easy. So we try to make it as simple as possible. Got it. Now, is it simple enough yet? The answer I can tell you is no. What What's the and goal? The reason about? I can tell you it's no yeah. is because our second top customer service request ticket is how do I post something for sale? <laughs> right. It's still not simple enough. Right. So how do you how do you fix that? Like what's the end goal? Just like you take a picture and it automatically knows what it is. Like I don't know how So how that we works. do a lot of lean UX validations and we do them very quickly. And so when we go out to these markets, pop up markets, we're actually you'll see us standing there with paper demos of what we're doing and asking people to test. And what we're looking for is how do we really simplify it? And the re thing I always tell my team is, you know, when we've won is when your grandmother right. picks up the grandson's iPad, takes a picture of that chair, right. posts it for sale, and has never used an online service before ever. And never even thought, of, didn't have to think about <clears throat> doing it. Yeah. I said, that's when our UX is good enough. Grandma's and, the holy grail for sure. And today we're not there yet. Right. We're good, but not good enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I always say like if my if my mother who's seventy five years old can do it, it was like the programming the VCR in the old days. Yeah, I couldn't do it. So yeah, it's the same thing with this. Exactly, got it. So we've got to keep working, and it's a lot of work. We do spend a lot of time investing and a lot of time testing yeah. because we don't know how to make it simple right. enough.
Okay, so we spent a decent amount of time actually going through your entire history and the development of the marketplace, not just in Thailand, but in Southeast Asia. I spent a lot of time talking about Kaidi, and it's been fascinating actually for me. As I've said to you before, these are a lot of questions that I've wanted to ask you, but kind of didn't want to dominate you on stage when we were at Echelon because I just didn't think it would be friendly. I may have put, a, may have put your audience to sleep already. <laughs> no, highly <laughs> unlikely. Um, but now I want to talk like in more general terms about the development of e-commerce in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. In particular, I'd like you to end with your opinion about the Lippo Group's announcement to allocate $500 million to invest in an online e-commerce business called Matahari Mall. And the reason why is because it seems to me like they've kind of entered like a small time poker game yeah. with a massive amount of money. They've been dealt some cards and they've said, you don't know what I have, but I'm all in now and I call. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. So do you feel like that's the same thing? And what do you feel like their impact is going to be not just on your business, but on the whole business in, in, in general? Yeah. So I guess um, let me kind of pull back into a kind of a smaller scope of the question, though, which is where do we see this going in Thailand? I think uh, we just started to scratch the surface on e-commerce right. you know, for Kaidi. We are kind of like the very first baby step towards e-commerce for any, any particular economy. Right? You start out with a basic marketplace for secondhand items, you know, classified, typical classified business. Um, and where you go from that is building services that are more comprehensive. So in terms of the payments, the logistics right. and everything like that. And what we're seeing now is a lot more investment into that area, into that area in just not just Thailand, but also Indonesia, Vietnam, across the region, right. Philippines as well. I think the biggest splash has been in Indonesia, where I believe for Thailand in particular is that we've just hit that inflection point where people where things are really going to take off. I think 2016 is going to be a really exciting massive, year. Massive. Um, it's going to be the services are finally catching up where people are going, hey, this is convenient. This is nice to use. Right. Um, and it does work, and I think that's really going to shift the business to where you're going to see significant leaps in terms of the volumes um, in, in, of transactions that are happening. So it's still in early days, so it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to grow to like five or ten percent of of uh, retail, um, you know, the retail industry anytime soon. But right. it's on that path. It is. If we look at a broader view of the world, Indonesia is where everybody's super excited about. My opinion of this, um, it seems to me that there are going to be some people that really get hurt out yeah, of this. There's going to be a lot of be, pain. There's going to be a lot of pain. A lot of pain. Um, I think a lot of people have gone crazy over the size of the population there and looked at it and going, oh, wow, look at the size of this. This looks like Brazil. Right. Um, the problem between there and Brazil is a GDP problem. Per capita, yeah. So if you look at the per capita GDP, you know, Indonesia is only half of Thailand right. um, with three times the population. So three, four times population. Right. So it is an interesting market, mm -hmm. but it still has a long ways to go. It's also a geographically di di uh, uh, disparate place. And, and very fragmented. You know, you've got 11, I, say, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of islands they have, right? right. Something like 11 or 12 or Lord knows how many right. islands that people live on. So I think there's definitely some challenges there. In terms of the Matahari Mall um, announcement, I thought it was very bold for a local group to put that much behind it. Right. And I think it's... Um, Are you convinced that they're really going to spend a half a billion dollars on this, though? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't dare... It's an open question, though, right? It's pure... I wouldn't... I don't have any information, so I can't even I. speculate on right. this. I don't know if they really will or not, but it's... Is definitely a big statement. You know, it's where you know. I think when Flipkart did their raise in India, and then Amazon came back and said, "Well, we're going to put in a billion or two billion over the next few years into the into the business." I think Matahari is probably making a similar statement of they're serious about this, right, I think and so. they're willing to invest into it. So I think, you know, I wish them the best, and I think the more the more excitement and the more investment that we can get in the region, the better it is for the whole industry. Agreed completely. And over the years, it's been, and I'll say this specifically for Thailand, it's been kind of like the, the little kept secret of Southeast Asia. You know, people got excited about Vietnam up until about 2008, 2009, and all of a sudden everybody got started getting really excited about Indonesia. Right. And in between, it was like, hello, I'm still in Thailand. Yo. Right. <laughs> and so I think all that attention is good for the industry overall. Um, for the e-commerce industry, we've got a long ways to grow, but there are a lot of big battles happening. Yeah. And um, 
some people are going to lose some money out of this. Well, there's a ton sure. of money. I, I, I like this actually, not only because of the boldness, but because what they're doing, as what you said earlier, is they're educating the market. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. An old line business has actually agreed to spend X amount of dollars, whatever it is, even if it's 50 million bucks, yeah. to build a new online business. Yeah. It validates the whole concept. Just like when Lazada and Zalora were in Thailand, they yeah. spent all this money on advertising, TV, billboards, online, everything. Yes. It helps you. It does. It definitely does. You don't does care because then when you go to someone and say, you should buy online, like, I know that. Yeah. We're going to do we're, we're this. We're not in, we're nowhere close to being in a red ocean. We are no, still no, no, very no. much a big blue ocean. It's just, it's still a greenfield situation. Yeah. And those of us in the industry, we need to continue to help each other because fighting over a small pot pie is not, not worth it. No, and when they do this, yeah. this is what I think it's going like this. You're just expanding the pie. And exactly. there's plenty of pie to be taken. Exactly. And plenty of pie to be made. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. thank you. Look, I, want, I really want to thank you for coming here today to do this. Like I said, these have always been questions that I wanted to ask you and have not had the opportunity to do so. And hopefully what we'll do is maybe in six months from now, we can come back and revisit. And so now that we have all the details, yeah. we can just see how things have changed. Yeah, it'd be exciting. And thank you for having me. I hope uh, the audience enjoys this as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. I'd like to thank Tio York, the head coach of Kaidi.com, for coming in and talking to us today. My name is Michael Waits, and this was Michael Talks Tech. Thank <laughs> you.